In 1996, off the shore of a North Carolina beach, a private researching firm discovered wreckage of what appeared to be from an old ship. It was discovered in approximately 28 feet of water, about one mile off the shoreline. The researchers knew exactly what they were looking for, but had no idea that they had just stumbled upon it. After 280 years on the seabed, the pages in history would be dialed back, all the way back to 1718 a year that would coincidentally fall on the edge of what is widely known as the Golden Age of Piracy. The ship was the Queen Anne's Revenge, and the captain, Edward Teach. And just who was Edward Teach? Well, that would be the world-famous, legendary pirate of the 18th century, Blackbeard. I'm Bradley Hall, and you're listening to Beyond the Harbor. The Queen Anne's Revenge is arguably the most famous pirate ship of all time due to the link it has with Blackbeard. But she didn't start her life as a skull and bones pirate ship. The ship was originally constructed in Great Britain during the early 1700s under the name the Concorde. Its original design was to be used as a merchant's vessel, which are intended only to be used to transport cargo, and in this case, trading goods back and forth with other allied countries. After only being in service for one year, the Concorde was overtaken by the French and given a name change. They could have chosen any name or phrase to give their newly captured vessel. Something very cool and French sounding comes to mind. Instead, they chose to keep it original, with a bit of a French twist, if you will. She would now set sail as the Le Concorde de Nantes. The French must have been real creatives in this time period. The new addition to the French fleet would be adapted to be used as a slave transporting ship. She would go on to make three successful trips between the triangular trade route, which consisted of stops in the African slave coast and the Caribbean islands. During the time that the Concorde was making its slave voyages, Blackbeard was learning the ways of the seas as a young pirate. He took over command of Steed Bonnet's ship called, appropriately for the use, the Revenge. His young pirate life was beginning to set sail. And yes, the pun here is most definitely intended. On the 28th day of November in 1717, Blackbeard's ship attacked a seemingly average non-hostile merchant ship carrying slaves. After firing across the broadside killing several crewmen, it forced the captain to surrender to the pirates. The Le Concorde was now in Blackbeard's possession along with all the cargo that was aboard. It was a pretty obvious move here as to what their intentions with the new ship were going to be, right? But first they were going to have to name it. And as the title of this episode suggests, the name Blackbeard settled on was the Queen Anne's Revenge. Albeit a bit long for a ship's name, It had a really deathly ring to it. It is also believed to be based off the sympathy Blackbeard had to the Jacobite cause, with Queen Anne serving as the last Stuart monarch. Either way, what a great name for a pirate ship. After renaming the Concorde, Blackbeard then began a total renovation overhaul of the ship from top to bottom. This is a crucial move if you are a pirate looking to intimidate measly merchant ships passing by. He had the ship armed with 40 cannons and the cargo holds filled with ammunition to take down any enemy ship that he may come in contact with. His first attack would be on a ship called the Great Allen. Blackbeard and his band of bloody pirates forced the crew of the Great Allen to surrender. He ordered them closer to the shoreline where they emptied their cargo holds and took all their possessions before burning the vessel to the ground, or in this case to the bottom of the sea. Blackbeard's next encounter while captaining the Queen Anne's Revenge would be with another merchant ship named the Margaret. The Margaret was captained by Henry Bostock. 
The story of this encounter doesn't play out as a normal pirate on civilian crime most would believe to be told. There was no sword fighting, cannon blasts, or walkings of the plank. Instead, Blackbeard and his crew took the sailors prisoners for about eight hours while they pillaged and plundered the Margaret's payload. After the ransacking, the next logical move as a pirate would be to kill or enslave the prisoners and turn their vessel to ash. After all, isn't that what the history books teach? But Blackbeard had other ideas. He let Henry Bostock and his crew return to the Margaret unharmed and was allowed to sail away without a scratch, albeit a much lighter payload than he arrived with. Although the cargo holds were emptied, I'm sure Bostock appreciated the new speed and maneuvering capabilities of his ship. Or maybe he was just happy to still have his head. Bostock went on to return to his base of operations on St. Christopher Island. He then reported what had happened to him and his crew to the governor, Walter Hamilton. Hamilton wanted a full breakdown of what Blackbeard and his crew were up to on the open seas. Bostock gave up many details, including how many ships and crew members Blackbeard had at his disposal, and also future plans that they were going to lie in wait for an expected Spanish armada that was rumored to have boatloads of gold and silver aboard. Again here, the pun is intended. The description Bostock gives about Blackbeard is the first recorded account of his appearance where they ultimately derive his pirate nickname. He is described by author Charles Johnson as, quote, such a figure that the imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. Johnson goes on to say that in times of battle, he could be seen wearing a sling over his shoulders with a three brace of pistols, hanging in holsters like bandoliers and stuck lighted slow matches under his hat. All of this to say, Blackbeard was nobody to mess around with, which is why it's unclear as to the reasoning of letting Henry Bostock and crew board the Margaret and sail away. Maybe he knew the fear that he struck at him and that those tales would resonate in the halls of history. Or maybe he was just having a good day. Either way, out of all the encounters Blackbeard had with captives on the seas, there are no verified accounts of him ever harming or murdering them. Though it begs the question, if you were captured and murdered by him, how does one verify this account from the bottom of the seafloor? For the next year, Blackbeard and company used the Queen Anne's Revenge to terrorize shipping lanes in the Atlantic. Their reputation preceded them, and they rarely had to go into battle before the other ships would surrender immediately to avoid the feared wrath of the legendary pirate. Arguably, their biggest haul came when they were able to successfully blockade the port of Charleston for one whole week in April of 1718. They plundered many ships both entering and exiting the port during this time. The town eventually gave in and offered up a valuable chest of medicines to make him and his company leave. We can only speculate as to what type of medicines this could have been. I'm thinking it probably belongs to a medicine category of the gold or silver type, but that's just a guess. For the next couple of months after the blockade, it is unclear the moves that Blackbeard and his crew made probably some usual merchant stops here or there, just to keep the bills paid. You know, typical pirate business. The beginning of the end of the Queen Anne's Revenge is kind of funny to me. She didn't go out in the blaze of glory between a pirate and a navy battle or any other enemy ships. There was no glorious ending to this well-used and rugged pirate ship. The pirate set sail to enter Old Topsail Inlet in North Carolina. Today, it is known as the Beaufort Inlet. As the Queen Anne's Revenge set sail with Blackbeard at the helm, he ran the ship aground on a sandbar about a mile out from the shoreline. Truly a rookie blunder for a well-seasoned pirate, if you ask me. It was here where they were forced to leave behind their beloved ship that had brought them so many victories on the Atlantic. If it were you who fell victim to one of their plunders, I could see this as being a glorious day of celebration. Finally, the Queen Anne's Revenge had made her final voyage and met her ill-witted fate, 
a sandbar. Researchers over the years uncovered supposedly two eyewitness accounts that would help shed light on the approximate location to where the ship was lost. A deposition by David Harriet, who was a former captain of the ship, the Adventure, which was a ship that sailed in Blackbeard's fleet and also ran aground the same day, says, They ran aground off the bar of Topsail Inlet. Captain Ellis Brand of the HMS Lime wrote a letter dated July 12th of 1718 to the Lords of Admiralty and stated, On the 10th of June or thereabouts, a large pirate ship of 40 guns with three sloops in her company came upon the coast of the North Carolina where they endeavored to go into harbor called Topsail Inlet. When the ship stuck upon the bar at the entrance of the harbor and is lost, as is one of the sloops. The sloop he is referring to here is the adventure as mentioned in David Harriet's deposition on the incident, as David was aboard the adventure when the ship was grounded. This begs the question, did Blackbeard, a well-seasoned captain in Pirates of the Seas no less, really make a mistake of this magnitude by accident? Something he should have been well aware of after many years of sailing on the seas, one might think. Or maybe something else. Maybe he had intentionally grounded the Queen Anne's Revenge. But why? Why would he ground a ship that he worked so hard to prepare for war and strike fear into every vessel to sail near the skull and bones flag raised at high mast? One theory is that he wanted to break up the crew and loot and take only the best for himself. History will probably never know the truth about the ship's grounding, but it's definitely fun for us to speculate on. Either way, after she was lost to the sandbar, Blackbeard along with his hand-picked crew and the most valuable of all the plunder they had gathered through the years, had disembarked and made an escape, leaving the rest of the crew behind to fend for themselves. This concludes the story of what was known as the Concorde, and then, thanks to the French, La Concorde de Nantes, and finally as we know her today as the Queen Anne's Revenge. For the next 278 years, the ship lay waste at the bottom of the sea, thought by many to never be seen again. Until one day in 1996, a private research team led by Mike Daniel of Intersol Incorporated discovered her based off the approximate location of only two records that existed of the event. For 15 years, the Queen Anne's Revenge was excavated and finally in 2011 was confirmed to be the ship that everyone expected it to be. The ship belonging to the legendary pirate himself. The shipwreck has now produced over 300,000 artifacts including weapons, cannons, medical equipment, and a massive anchor. Today, many of these artifacts can be viewed on display at North Carolina's Maritime Museum in Beaufort, North Carolina. The story of Blackbeard doesn't end with the grounding of the Queen Anne's Revenge. Hang around a minute and I'll tell you all about how the legendary pirate ultimately met his demise. After the grounding of the Queen Anne's Revenge, it was said that Blackbeard went into retirement to enjoy the spoils of his riches that he had amassed over the years of his piracy life. But just six months after entering retirement, he seemingly got bored and began to plunder once more. This would ultimately lead to the demise of the legendary Blackbeard. He met his match on November 22nd of 1718 with the battle against Lieutenant Robert Maynard of the British Navy. A hefty incentive bounty was offered for the head of Blackbeard. Maynard found Blackbeard and crew on the inner side of the Oracoke Island. The actual history of this battle is not very clear. Most reports state that Blackbeard was able to blast his way through, cutting Maynard's fleet by a third. One way or another, Blackbeard's ship eventually ran onto the sandbar. 
This may be a tip of the hat to how he ran the Queen Anne's Revenge aground as well. Maynard had kept most of his men below deck to act as a surprise attack to spring on the pirates. The two ships came together, and what was about to ensue would be a battle that could be plucked directly out of a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Blackbeard led his men aboard, unaware of the manpower Maynard had hidden away just below deck. Suddenly, Maynard's men burst out from below and began the full-on assault of the pirates, attacking them with flintlocks and swords in close combat. One account actually indicates that Blackbeard was able to break Maynard's sword away and got the upper hand on him. If it weren't for the overwhelming numbers Maynard had at his disposal, this could have been his demise. However, the men were able to push the pirates back and surround them from the bow. While Blackbeard was completely surrounded, he would never surrender. He went in for the attack on Maynard with his sword, but as he charged forward, one of Maynard's men was able to catch him with a huge slash across his neck. This slash crippled the legendary pirate right in his tracks. He was then quickly attacked by the rest of Maynard's crew to finish him off. As soon as the rest of Blackbeard's crew realized what had happened, they withdrew their weapons and surrendered. The battle was over. Blackbeard had met his fate. After the smoke cleared, so to say, Maynard was able to examine Blackbeard's body and noted that he had been shot five times and slashed at least 20 times. Maynard then took Blackbeard's lifeless body and severed off his head. He then tossed the corpse in the sea and suspended the head from his bowsprit. This was to show everyone his accomplishment and to claim the reward bounty sent on Blackbeard's head, literally. Just as the demise of the Queen Anne's Revenge ended on a sandbar, ironically so too did the life of her legendary captain, who will be forever echoed in the halls of history. And that man's legacy lives on to this day. This episode was written and produced by me, Bradley Hall. If you enjoyed this story as we explored the history of the Queen Anne's Revenge and her legendary captain, Blackbeard, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to help us bring more of these stories to you. Questions, comments, or feedback can be submitted on my website. Thanks for listening. <laughs>